So on to today's topic. Um, the, the issue of engaged in this workshop first came to my attention when I was asked back in 2008 to act as an expert in two separate murder trials in London. The cases were very different, but in both of them, violent rap lyrics written by defendants have been admitted as evidence. Defence counsels, including colleagues of Khalid, who is us here today, um, approached me because they wanted an explanation for judge and jury of two things. They wanted me to explain the context of writing these verses, and they wanted explanations of specific lyrics that the Crown was placing particular significance on. I was asked because I'd written a book on US gangster rap. A similar music trend has since developed and became very popular in the UK, grind rap. Um, and the lyrics in question in these cases, and in most of the cases that I've been involved with that followed, were grime lyrics, um, all written by black British working class youth. What became apparent as I started to look into this trend is that such cases were very prevalent in the US. Eric, my co-organiser today, soon made contact and greatly expanded my understanding of this phenomenon in America. And Eric will in a moment introduce more on the US context. But as an American studies scholar working in the UK, I was intrigued by the comparative dimensions um, of thinking about overlapping trends between the US and the UK, um, the phenomenon, but also how the legal use of rap lyrics differed between countries. Through the cases I was involved in, through understanding the scale of the use of rap music in American trials, and it is quite an alarming scale, um, and through engaging with the work of scholars in this area, um, in particular Andrea Dennis, John Street, um, Eric and his co-author Charles Kubrin, all presenting today, I started to get a stronger sense of the social and racial justice dimensions of this area, um, youth justice actually, dimensions of this area, um, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about today. I also started to develop a sense of the topic's multidisciplinary scope, reflected in the range of academic researchers here today from sociology, English, American studies, criminology, linguistics, cultural studies, and politics. Today we'll hear from the leading US academics in this subfield who can report on a scene that is increasingly well-researched and well-mapped. Um, and we can hear from key UK academics and practicing lawyers um, so that we can develop a better picture of the UK trends. Um, one starting assumption that I'm looking forward to having tested today is that the use of defendant composed rap lyrics in court cases is not only less prevalent in the UK, but also when it is introduced, tends to have less traction than in the US. We'll certainly hear today from UK cases where rap lyrics prove very effective for prosecutors, um, but I base my starting assumption on several other UK trials where defence counsels managed to neutralise or exclude the rap lyrics uh, pre-trial. Um, and um, so that's, I really have anecdotal evidence at this stage, so I'm excited to, to get, to, for us to get more of a, a, a kind of um, picture of what the overall trends might be in the UK. I hope that today's conversations prove um, my starting assumption that the rap lyrics are less effective uh, in UK courtrooms. I hope that's proved to be right. Um, especially given the slashing of legal aid budgets in the UK, which I'm sure our lawyers can speak to, um, prejudicial use of rap lyrics is likely to be subject to less robust challenge by hard-pressed defence counsels in the future. Um, however, a second starting assumption I'm looking forward to having tested today is that in the UK, just as in the US, there is heavy policing, regulating and criminalising of rap music and rap culture. We'll be hearing uh, about one UK case today where young black men with no prior convictions were facing a custodial sentence, mainly for performing and publishing um, music through social media. Um, just a, one rhyme rap track amongst other tracks that were romance or you know, different genres of rap. Um, and I'm delighted that we have um, defence lawyer Karen May uh, here to speak to that case. Um, by better understanding the UK picture and by drawing insights, frameworks and approaches from US experts, we hope that today's workshop helps to develop a more complex comparative picture with a view to enhancing understanding, raising awareness, developing networks and working out how scholars can best support lawyers in ensuring fair trials. Thank you. Well, I want to say first of all that I, am, um, I feel very fortunate to be here. Um, uh, for one, I think that this is, this, this is something I've been working on for the last few years. Um, it has been um, eye-opening at a number of levels, uh, but I think uh, at some point, uh, I've always known, we've always known, uh, 
um, that it's been important to expand this work outside the sort of boundaries of the United States and start looking about that, how this is functioning um, in other countries. We, we've worked on cases in Canada for sure, and I know of several cases um, in, the, in the UK. And so to look at the way our various justice systems are responding, I think, uh, I hope over the course of today, uh, will be productive. Um, I also uh, feel lucky because the two people really responsible for starting this, this area of scholarship are in this room, and I'm not one of them. Um, <laughs> One of them is Beth McGuinn. Um, I, started, I started along this by accident. I stumbled across something that she had done, a presentation perhaps that you had given. I saw something online about your testimony in one of these cases. And I thought, well, if they're prosecuting rap music, I mean, if they're using rap as evidence in criminal cases in the UK, I'm quite certain um, <laughs> that they're doing it in the incarceration capital of the world, which I <laughs> perhaps call home. Um, <laughs> And as I started digging, um, I found out that that was indeed true. Um, and over the course of the, net, you know, the ensuing years, I've seen the scope of it, and it is alarming. Um, as I started that research, I, I thought to myself, why is nobody talking about this? Uh, this is unbelievable. Uh, and so I started digging, and sure enough, it turns out that one person had been talking about it. Uh, back in 2007, um, Andrea Dennis, um, wrote what is um, almost certainly the um, seminal article um, on this. And as I read her piece, um, it sort of started, it started to just peel away the layers um, of this practice, which has since really, I think, exploded um, in the US. Uh, but she was very early um, to, to sort of see and reveal this trend and all of its sort of disturbing implications, or at least many of them. So I feel lucky to be here. Uh, and so what I've done is taken their work and stolen it, I've appropriated it, uh, and run with it. Uh, and I've done that um, with them, of course, um, and also with uh, Professor Charles Cooper, who will be Skyping in later. She's on an eight-hour time difference, so it's going to be at the end of the day. Uh, but just to give you a sense of what we've been doing, um, we decided to do, take a two-pronged approach to this. Um, we published an article on this called Rap on Trial in an academic journal, Race and Justice. But we also made the decision early on, and I'll talk more about this at the end of the day, um, to, take, um, to, to take it to the public, uh, to try to expand awareness of this um, in the public sphere. Uh, because uh, you know, an academic journal, if it's successful, you know, maybe 500 people will read your article. Um, we wanted millions of people talking about this. And so our sort of opening salvo, the beginning of this, was an op-ed in the New York Times, which then led to non-stop media coverage over the next couple of years that has allowed us to sort of use, to turn this into a national discussion, not just an academic one. But I don't mean to uh, diminish the importance of the academic side either. I see them as working off one another, and that's certainly been the case um, for us. This op-ed in the New York Times, um, we, we, we opened that op-ed uh, with the case of the uh, Vontae Skinner. Um, this was a young man in New Jersey who was accused of attempted murder in the 2005 shooting um, a man named Lamont Peterson. Both of them were admitted drug dealers. Um, Skinner said he had nothing to do with the crime, um, and prosecutors um, had very little to work with in terms of physical evidence, and what little eyewitness testimony they had was um, uh, complicated at best, right? What the victim said Skinner was the shooter, then said Skinner was definitely not the shooter, then Skinner, so the, the trial was a mess, or it would have been a mess, and so what prosecutors did um, was actually quite clever. Um, uh, given their, their lack of evidence, they introduced um, 13 pages um, of his violent rap lyrics. They were permitted to read them uninterrupted in front of the jury, um, including uh, lines like, yo, look in my eyes, you can see death coming quick. Look in my palms, you can see what I'm gunning with. I play no games when it comes to this war shit. If death were a jacket, you can see how the floor fits, and so forth. Um, he was found guilty um, and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Um, the case uh, eventually went to an appellate court in New Jersey. The appellate court found that the use of rap lyrics was inappropriate, that they were highly prejudicial and should not have been included. Uh, but because it was a split decision at the appellate level, it automatically went up to the state Supreme Court, which recently ruled unanimously that the appellate court was correct and that the uh, lyrics should not have been admitted and that, the, and that uh, Skinner was entitled to a new trial. That case is ongoing now. That's a rare victory in a sea of losses. Um, and what we're finding, in fact, 
um, is that across the United States, uh, prosecutors are introducing rap lyrics um, in a variety of ways. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a slight oversimplification, but this is these categories I think generally hold up and is sort of dictate how we, we organize today's session. Um, as autobiographical confessions, right, you are supposed to read these lyrics as literal re reflections of what the defendant has done in the past. Um, as uh, evidence of a defendant's knowledge, motive, or uh, identity, right, the motive and intent, um, um, or um, what we're seeing more and more of, um, true threats, where rap lyrics are not being used as evidence of a defendant's involvement in some underlying crime, but where rap lyrics are themselves the crime treated as a terrorist threat, uh, thanks in part anyway uh, to laws passed post 9-11 that have made it easier for prosecutors to bring those kinds of charges. Um, we're finding, and, and we're, we still don't know how big this is. We know there are hundreds of cases. We suspect, we're almost certain, it's gonna be thousands by the time we're done. If you include all the stages of the criminal justice process in which they are used. So trials are the obvious ones. Um, but for example, I'm working right now on three death penalty cases, and in two of them, the lyrics were not used to establish guilt, but were used in the second sentencing phase. And so we're finding that rap lyrics are brought in there. They're also brought in before the trial in indictments, and unfortunately those are hard for us to access because in many cases they're sealed. Um, and we know for a fact that these are being used in less formal ways. For example, prosecutors are using them to secure plea bargains, right? If you're a defense attorney, even if your client says, you know, I didn't do it, a defense attorney knows how powerful these lyrics can be, um, and they can be used as leverage to compel these, these plea bargains. We know the numbers are big. We're getting anecdotal stories, you know, the stories are anecdotal still, but for defense attorneys who are talking about how, how they walk down a hallway in a courtroom, and the same rap video with 10 guys sort of mugging for the camera is being played in every single one because prosecutors are indicting every single person who showed up in that video. They're often trying to establish a gang connection of those videos, and we'll talk more about that. Um, not surprisingly, the overwhelming majority of uh, defendants are young men of color, um, and they are typically amateur rappers. That's not to say more well-known artists haven't faced this either, uh, but they tend to have name recognition as artists and the resources to mount um, serious defenses, okay? Um, and the most important point here is there is no other fictional form, musical or otherwise, that is targeted this way um, in, in the courts. And so uh, what it ultimately boils down to um, is the negation of rap um, as art. I mean, that's what we are seeing, uh, and that's the reason why it's been targeted. Um, as Professor Dennis noticed, uh, notes in her in the seminal article I referred to earlier, right? Rarely do judicial decisions explicitly acknowledge that lyrics may employ metaphor, exaggeration, and other artistic devices. And as she also notes, um, as a result, when the courts allow prosecutors to admit rap lyrics as evidence, they allow the government to uh, obtain a stranglehold on the case. And I probably worked, uh, I've been an expert on maybe seven or eight, and a consultant on another 25 or 30. Um, and I've seen that over and over. We've seen a few victories, uh, but generally speaking, uh, Professor, what Professor Dennis said in 2007 um, is the case now. And so, what we're finding um, is that uh, we, we've got these different types of cases that are coming up, and that's sort of how we organize today's session. Um, rap is a confession. Um, rap, uh, or, or as, a, as a reflection of your state of mind, of motive and intent, um, rap as threats, uh, which I talked about earlier, and then rappers as gang members. I think we've got a whole separate section that's going to start to address that. Um, that's been particularly um, um, salient in the U.S., particularly in states like California, that's sort of been ground zero for these sort of gang prosecutions um, and using rap to uh, secure convictions. And so what we're seeing in the U.S., as I'll sum it up, is case after 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 case. And so what I hope what we're able to do today is talk um, about, I mean, to be frank, how to combat this, um, but also what the larger implications are, both uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, race relations, um, and how we're viewing um, art in general. So I look forward to it. Thanks.